Hello, welcome to Clickbait. Now, if you've been on YouTube in the last few weeks, you cannot have avoided people losing their absolute of the new Canon EOS R5 and R6 mirrorless cameras. Now, this is not one of those. This is where it all started. Now, an interesting thing about Canon and Nikon and even Sony with their mirrorless cameras is they've all moved away from their traditional lens mounts. Canon with the R mount, Nikon with the Z mount. Sony, they've moved away from the A mount they started from, which was taken from Minolta back from the 80s. But the first camera manufacturer to do this was actually Canon back in 1987. Back in the late 80s, the camera landscape was a very different place indeed. Nikon was the undisputed top dog of the professional world, and pros had spent an absolute fortune on manual focus lenses. Canon was a serious amateur's camera, though like a hobbyist who had a bit of money and was really into photography. They had less to lose, but still didn't really want to be annoying their customer base by you know, ch making them chuck out all of their lenses. Sony, they were making Walkmans and TVs at the time. So in 1987, Canon took a massive long-term gamble when they decided to ditch the FD lens mount, their manual lens mount, and bring in the new EOS EF lens mount. EOS, incidentally, stands for Electronic Optical System. Bet you didn't know that. In March 1987, they released their EOS system, but not, as you might expect, with the 600, because that would be logical. The first one was the 620, and two months later, the 650. And then finally, two years later, they kind of brought it all together with the best one of the early EOSes, the 600. Now back in 1989, when I was at school, this was my dream camera. I really wanted a Nikon F4 as well because they were very, very, very cool indeed. But this thing, when it came out with autofocus, built-in motor drive, built-in everything, in fact, it was unbelievable. It was so cool. Because also back then, on most cameras that your average consumer would buy, nothing was built-in. If you wanted a motor drive, you had to buy a screw-on motor drive that clunked on the bottom and looked really clunky and was quite slow. Autofocus just wasn't really a thing, apart from on some Minolta's just before this. And so, yeah, auto exposure modes were a bit exotic as well. So this thing did everything in one body from the factory and it did it well. And it did it well because it coupled them together. So things like the motor drive and the autofocus work together. There's two focusing modes. There's a continuous tracking focus mode, which works relatively well for a, such an early system. And there's a one shot system. In continuous mode, it can shoot to two and a half frames a second, which was as fast as most decent cameras could at the time. In one shot focus mode, which just focuses, locks, and then stays there, it did five frames a second. Only the top professional cameras could do that then. That was exciting. Being 30, or they progressed things a little bit more in those two years, so the faster motor drive, it was faster focus. It was the first one with predictive autofocus, so in that continuous servo, it could track a subject and follow it to where it thought the subject would be when you hit the shutter. And metering came a long way with this camera as well. Six zone evaluative metering, which was pretty impressive. And there was a smaller system as well, not quite spot metering, but just a partial zone metering, a six and a half percent circle in the middle. So not quite spot, but not far off. Then of course there were the function modes, of course, as well as having aperture priority, manual, shutter priority, the usual things you expect to find on a camera. This had actual program modes, which was quite exciting. So P1 standard mode, P2 quick shot, P3 landscape, P4 sports, P5 portrait, close up, indoor, just flip open the button on the back and you've got this extra little panel of buttons, which gives you more controls hidden carefully away. And these just override the standard program mode, so in sport mode it would prioritize shutter speed, in portrait, it would prioritize aperture, that kind of thing. But the best one, the most impressive one, which I don't think I've ever seen on another camera, the depth of field mode. You set it into program depth, focus on the first point nearest to you, focus on the second point furthest away from you, hit the button, and it'll set the aperture to only show that bit in focus. That's ingenious. Now these things set the design language for all Canon EOSes for the last 33 years. But lots of things really haven't changed despite everything else changing. For example, even the eye cup on the latest Canons, or DSLRs, still fit on this one. Back at launch, there were only 13 lenses for the new system, and a lot of those are multiples in different apertures. So anyone buying into the new EOS system was stuck with, I okay, had a few exotic things like a 300mm and a fisheye, but mostly you had a 50mm and a couple of short standard zooms. What is really stunning with this camera is how bright the viewfinder is. People get excited now about the number of dots and pixels in the EVF of a mirrorless camera, but there is nothing like the sharpness of this viewfinder. But really, I think we need to go and take it on the street and use some photos. And before we do that, let's put some film on it. Roll of FP4, because we love a bit of FP4. But hey, this is another great thing as well. It's auto-loading and DX-loading as well. So looking inside it, we've got the little 
brass contacts which read the DX code on the back of the film, so you don't have to worry about setting that. You can override it if you want to though. Then just drop the film in there, line it up against this little orange mark, ready to go. So much less faff than car cameras a year before that. Brilliant. Right, let's go and take some photos. Well, through some internet TV magic, I'm here with something exciting to take photos of behind me. Uh, literally a second later. Right, now with the EOS 600 in my hands, it's an interesting kind of combination of old school simplicity of film cameras and modernity because you do have interesting little dials and things like you would do on a new camera, but at the same time, there's nothing on the back. There's only one screen with not much information on it, but there is enough information. This is the great thing with this. It's kind of a digital camera for the film age. Oh, other way around, a film camera for the digital age because it does everything you want to do, but nothing more. So firing it up, a little dial on the back, go from L for lock to A for actually doing things. I hit the mode button, you can choose shutter priority, aperture priority, depth mode, which I really like, manual or program. If I'd gone the other way to this little green square, that would have given me the program modes, the program standard, quick shot, landscape, all those. But I'm going to go with auto and aperture priority, which is very simple. Now, turning around to take a picture of this rather nice ship behind me, HMS Cavalier at the Chatham Dockyard, do come and pay them a visit. They, uh, could, I'm sure they'd appreciate the visitors. Now, unlike arguments with Canon, Nikon, Sony about how many hundred focusing sensors they have, that's not quite such a priority here. You've got one. It's in the middle, so you can't really miss it. You point, you half press, and it's in focus. Now, now obviously being one of the first autofocus SLRs, it's not got many focusing clever functions like uh, moving on a touch dial on the back or full eye tracking as I later had. Find your subject, focus on it, keep the button half pushed, then recompose and shoot the picture which is old school how autofocus used to be in the olden days, well, the late 80s. Which is great, it's very easy to use, unless you're on a tripod, then it gets a little bit tricky. Okay, so let's get a picture of this superstructure and this kind of stuff. It's telling me it's f5.6, which I've selected, I'm gonna go down to f4.5. I'll go to you, f I'll go to f3.5, because this is a really fast, what is that, 1.8, I think. Yeah, 50 millimeter lens. Um, I'm gonna drop a shot of that mast. Oh, I hear that motor drive whine, I love that. There's lots of fantastic textures here in the low evening sun. Let's go find some more textures. Love that noise. It's only got the one dial on the front, which is your aperture, your shutter, depending which mode you're in. If you're in manual mode, when you want to be using both shutter and aperture, and you've only got the one dial, what do you do? You hit the little M button down here. So regular dial is shutter speed, M push plus dial is your aperture. Very easy to use. Ergonomically, they got this thing just right. I mean, I've got sort of reasonably middle to large size hands and this pops just right into my, my clammy little grasp. That grip is a brilliant innovation because before this, cameras didn't have this unless you had the bolt-on motor drive. So most average amateur cameras, which this is aiming at the high-end amateur market, would have just been a flat front, which were pretty uncomfortable to hold for a long time. But they've been that way for years and years, so everyone accepted it. And it's easy to forget how much of a game changer this really was because up until this point, you didn't get autofocus and motor drive all built in. The nearest thing to this before this was maybe the Canon T90, which was a horrifically expensive, very high-end camera from Canon, but manual focus only. So this took all the best qualities of the T90, the built-in motor drive on, which was our big chunky grip underneath, so it still looked a bit like a bolt-on grip even then. The auto exposure modes, but then added the autofocus and these new ergonomics, which just worked so well, and this new lens mount, which the EF lens mount replaced the FD lens mount, and that meant that Canon suddenly had coupling for autofocus. This was just such a massive, massive leap forward. Um, I can actually do this and not worry about getting dust on the sensor because it's a film camera. Canon were able to make the amazing step to have completely electronically coupled lenses, so there's no mechanical linkage to the lens here. The motor is built into the lens, and that means each lens has got the motor that's appropriate to its size and its function so they can build them to work silently and fast much more effectively not hobbled like Nikon were by having the older F mount which was still a great selling point in many ways but it did hold them back so this is kind of what Nikon and Canon and Sony have done now with the new Z mount the R mount because it means they can focus on a larger lens mount which is allowing the focus on a film plane closer to the back of the glass which is why you can adapt it in one way and not the other now I know I said there are only 13 lenses at start up. If you look at the Z and the R ranges today, they didn't have much of a leap on that even now. 
this really is so cool because you've got all the advantages of a modern camera with all accurate metering, nice ergonomics, fast autofocus, which will actually predictively track. I mean, there's no one around here at the moment to predictively track on, on my own here in the dockyard at night. Not creepy at all. And this viewfinder is, oh my God, it's so crisp. It's amazing. Oh, I'm gonna take my hat off for this. I need to take my hat off. I literally take my hat off to Canon. This is such an advance. This is such a cool camera. I've wanted one of these so much for years and years. And do you know what it finally cost me to buy one in 2020, a mere 31 years after it came out? 30 pounds, well, plus a pound postage, so 31 pounds off eBay. Didn't come with a lens, I had to go and buy this separately, but I did borrow a lens off someone else and took it to London for a day just before lockdown to get a feel of it before I'd actually shot anything else with it. And, oh, wow, it was just so nice, it's so refreshing. Um, using film does kind of put you very much in mind to concentrate on what you're doing because I've got 36 shots on this roll of FP4 and in some ways I want to blast through it so I can go and develop it, but in others I'm being very careful I don't waste a single shot. Almost the only disadvantage to using a film camera that feels this modern in your hand is that you kind of forget you're not on digital sometimes. I keep reaching for the focus adjustment dial on the back so I can move the focus point. And also I keep hitting the maximum 2,000th of a second um, shutter speed. So up here, which is really bright, for example, I had it on f1.8 to try and get a really shallow depth of field. Suddenly it would realize it was flashing 2,000. So I reached for the ISO button. You can't do that. You can override the ISO on the film, but you can't do it per frame. You've got to do the entire film and then push process at the end. Obviously it's a different thing to talk about film on a different day but it's not really a big drawback but it, it, you forget you're shooting film almost because it's such a modern feeling camera which is incredible that it's lasted this long the other great thing with a camera like this is that the lenses are so cheap i paid i think 40 pounds for this absolutely mint pristine 50 millimeter f1.8 so here in my hand 70 quid and it's a completely well as up to date as film cameras really get so unless you're going to go for something like a, a much later eos one maybe it's still great fun to shoot film on an old-fashioned filming film camera because you get more of the whole atmosphere, but if you're just out shooting pictures, this is nice. Yeah, I've had to drop to f4 now because uh, f1.8 is just too bright. The screen up on top really does tell you everything you need to know. I'm currently I'm shooting at f4, push the button, tells me I'm maxing out at 2,000th of a second. I'm in aperture priority mode. I've taken 16 photos so far, I've been a bit sort of snap happy. And I'm in one shot focus mode. If I want to move to um, continuous servo focus mode, the little yellow button behind this little door in the back, which I believe EOS is still do use. Um, hit that yellow button, turn the single dial into AI servo mode. Back to one shot because I'm not shooting moving subjects right now. If I was worried that the battery was going to run out, because it only uses one battery, which is a big chunky lithium that sits behind here, undo this and lift it off, I can hit the battery test button, and it tells me I've got three full segments of battery in there. Awesome. There were a few accessories as well as the lenses and flash guns, obviously. You could get data backs for this, which was a big thing back in, well, the 80s and early 90s. If you wanted to record, I guess for scientific reasons, or just where you were and what you were doing, you could program it to flash a little kind of light of the date, the time, the exposure mode, and that kind of stuff into the back of your picture. So in the bottom of your image, you had it burned forever. Where, or not where you were, didn't have GPS then, the exposure details and the time and date. I do know I've really enjoyed shooting this just for a few minutes so far. This is such a nice camera to hold. I, I almost went Canon myself back years ago, but once you're committed to a system, it's very hard to break away and I'm full on Nikon these days. But this thing is just such a joy to hold and joy to use. It's so fast acting and the reaction time is really interesting. It does hunt a little bit if you don't hit the crosshairs on exactly the right point and more than we're used to these days with kind of lightning fast instant focus but yeah it's 31 years old i'm happy with that i'm going to be using this an awful lot in the future i'm going to, have to go and invest in some ef lenses which is a complete waste of money as i'm a nikon user who's moving to the nikon z at the moment so idiot well, I hope you've enjoyed look, exploring the history of film photography, the evolution of film gradually morphing into the current digital cameras we have today. If you'd like to see some more classic camera reviews, new camera reviews, and uh, more techniques and that kind of stuff, hit subscribe, please hit like, and hopefully I'll see you again soon on Clickbait.